Okay. All the time. All the time. God is good. And then uh, I want to share a few thoughts with you, all right? Are you ready? Say it with me. This is my Bible. It's God's holy word. It's given to teach me truth, to reprove me of sin, to correct me when I'm wrong, and instruct me in what is right. It's a lamp unto my daily walk and a light unto my eternal path. And if I hide his words in my heart, then I will not sin against God. This is my Bible, and it can change my life today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a seat if you would. It's good to see all of you. I don't see any visitors, so we will proceed. Memorial weekend, and uh, it's, uh, I like what someone said on uh, Facebook. Don't say happy memorial. It is, a, it is a time of remembrance for those who gave their lives Amen. that we could have this freedom to be able to meet together as a church. You know that we have some churches in the United States can't meet this morning because of government interference. Isn't that a shame? Amen. We had men who fought and died that they could meet. And uh, they're not being allowed to meet. That's a shame, isn't it? Well, 
Praise the Lord. Yeah, I know. Praise the Lord. We're getting to meet, and so we're praising the Lord for that. Because our government and our local governments are behind us and have been behind us the whole time, and praising the Lord for that. But I want to take just a second, just a, just a moment if I can. If, if you have somebody that you personally in your family or, or somebody that you knew that gave their lives for our freedoms by serving in the service, uh, would you please just raise your hand? Would you do that? Yeah, oh, man, see, I knew that. Praise the Lord. Uh, and I want you to know that aren't we blessed? Amen. You know, our freedom was expensive. Yes, right. When we talk about the freedom we have in Christ, we understand what Christ gave for us. And when we talk about the freedoms we have in our nation, America, it would cost a lot of lives for us to be able to have the freedoms we have. And uh, we don't want to ever take lightly that, uh, that sacrifice that was made. Many a, many a mother Sacrifice the greatest sacrifice of a child, a dad, a husband, a mother, a wife, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters that gave their lives so we could have this freedom. If I can, let's just bow for a moment and just silently for just a minute, just thank God for those many lives that give us the rights that we have as Americans. Our dear Father, sacrifice is something you know a great deal about. Some of us, Father, have not had to offer the sacrifices that many have. And so, Father, we as, as Americans, as a group of people, not just singularly, but as a corporate group, Lord, might we this day stop and recognize those who gave their lives that we might have freedom of speech, and freedom of press, and freedom of religion, freedom to serve, and freedom to live in this great nation. And Lord, may we never forget, may we never forget those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, for our nation. We thank you for what you've given us. And Lord, may we take care of it. May we be good stewards of what you've given us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, just a word about uh, this week. Uh, we will not have services tonight. We Memorial Weekend, we normally take that off and decide we'd go ahead and just take that off. So no services tonight. If you're looking on Facebook, you won't find them. Uh, and we won't be here at the church. Uh, we are having service. Uh, we're having a 945, a Sunday school. If you're getting up and getting ready, you might want to come on. At 9.45, where Jeff will be teaching Sunday school at 9.45 here in the auditorium, Unified Service. And then, uh, then the 11 o'clock service that won't be online. Then tomorrow, just to let you know, one of our old time members, Brother Randall Vincent, passed away this past week. And we'll be celebrating his life here in the auditorium tomorrow at 2 o'clock. And invite you to come and be a part of that as we uh, celebrate his life and uh, remember him. And then later in the week on Saturday at 10 o'clock, we also will be celebrating the life and memorial service for Miss Sally Cridlin, and uh, that's on Saturday. And all of you are welcome to come and attend those services as well. We are planning to start, we're gonna open our Sunday schools on uh, June the 7th, Sunday, June the 7th. Uh, this will be for our children and adults. Sunday school hour will take place. Our other building will be open and we'll be having Sunday school. And uh, we'll continue to have the services in here like we have, except we won't have Sunday school in here <laughs> unless we need to. But uh, as of right now, we plan to have Sunday schools in their regular places and uh, children's workers are gonna be here ready to work. We will have special uh, security uh, option, uh, uh, regulations that we will place. Uh, every child, every person that goes into such a building 
uh, will be uh, checked for their temperatures and uh, we are going to provide all the sanitation that we can uh, so that we can have that service. So I want you to come and be, uh, be unafraid. Just come on and be a part of what we're doing. We're doing more here in this church to keep you safe than probably most any place you're going. And uh, so uh, just come on. Church is open, and it's time to get back to serving the Lord and being in his house, and so we want you to be here. All right, so now you've been brought up to date on all the activities we've got going on so far, and um, we are thinking, we are planning a uh, vacation Bible school. Janet will be in touch with you, hopefully, or you need to get in touch with her. She's planning on a vacation Bible school at the end of July, right? Towards the end of July. And if you feel like you're not going to want to do that, then you need to let her know because she's going to be counting on you. July 20th to the 24th. July the 20th to the 24th. And so that's when we're planning it, and we're hoping that we can get our teachers on board, and we will. I know this. I was telling Ruby, I said, you know, uh, people have been camped out in their houses with their kids for so long. It might be that they're not going to be so concerned about the COVID as they will just to get some freedom from the kids for that week. We're liable to have the greatest vacation Bible school we've ever had with kids being here. But you know what? That's, let's, it's, let's just laugh about it and go on. Amen. That's what we're going to do. Um, we, uh, we hope to have, uh, let's see. I'll tell you about that later. All right. I think that's it. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and have our song service. So, Brother Jerry, if you'll come and lead us again, and uh, we'll go on with our song service. All right, let's all stand. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus, page 426, if you want to use the hymnal. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. And I remained my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath his cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in jesus my savior Sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me. Beyond the crystal sea About the angels singing And the old redemption story And some sweet day I'll sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me and i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath his cleansing flood please be seated
it, Richard? Richard's doing our special this morning. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 12. Let us get up early in the, early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vines flourish, where the tender grape appear and the pomegranates bud forth. There I will give you my love. <laughs> I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there None other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling but he bids me go through a voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share. As we tarry there, none other has ever known. Amen. 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 All right, if you will, take your Bibles out. Let's go to Romans chapter 7 this morning. Romans chapter 7, as you turn there, Paul is giving, the book of Romans again is Paul's, I think, his doctrinal thesis. It's his, it is exactly what he would teach a church if he were to come to the church for the first time. This is the material that he would use, and uh, it's so solid, it's so profound, it's so, um, it's so doctrinally I won't say correct, of course it's correct, it's the word of God, but uh, it's, uh, it just has so much meat for us, and it's good, yes, thank you, it's just good. Uh, we're down to chapter 7, let me just quickly 
carry you through the chapters where we've come from. Chapter 1, we saw a comparison of those who walk in righteousness and those who walk in unrighteousness. In chapter 2, there was a comparison of the Jew and the Gentile, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. Chapter 3, he talked of our righteousness compared to Christ's righteousness. And then chapter 4, he compared works to grace. Self-righteousness compared to Christ's imputed righteousness. Then in chapter 5, he spoke of the death of Adam compared to the life we have in Christ. Remember Romans 5.18 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. That was Adam. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that's Jesus, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And then chapter 6, he asked two questions. He began chapter uh, 6, verse 1. He asked the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? If grace is so great, then can we just count on it? And so we just sin any way we want to? And of course, the conclusion was no. Uh, Romans six fourteen says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. Yeah. And then Romans six fifteen, he asked the second question. What then shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but are under grace, God forbid. He says, and then he concludes in Romans 6, 22, when he says, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and to end everlasting life. In an ongoing description of our freedom from sin, we are also made free from the bondage of the law. I want to take you just real quick. Listen, as I read to you, Colossians chapter two, verse 13 through 14. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That's the law. Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. This is what happens when a person gets saved. We were under the law, but now we're under grace. We were uh, bound by sin, but now we're free uh, to serve in righteousness, His righteousness, not our own. And uh, now we can move forward as His children. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray now in the next few minutes that you'll take us and guide us, Father, through this text to accomplish what you want to as we share these thoughts. Lord, there's something here for each one of us if we listen. And we know, Father, that we're not here by mistake. We're here by design. And we know, Father, you promised your word will never come back void. And so, Father, if we're faithful to preach the word, we know that it's going to accomplish what it needs to in each life. I pray, Father, we would learn to live in the freedom that we've gained through Christ and stop regulating ourselves under some kind of legal system that keeps us in bondage even to sin. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In Romans chapter 7, he begins in these, these verses 1 through 6. I'm going to break it down. He begins with just a statement of truth. He just makes a statement, and then he's going to use an illustration, and then he's going to pull together a conclusion for us. And uh, it's interesting as you read it how simple it is or how, uh, how uh, he puts it in, in its context. He puts it just right. And so he begins with, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. So let me ask you a question. When he speaks to them that know the law, who do you think he's speaking directly to? The Jews, exactly. He's speaking to the Jews. How the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Paul is speaking to the Jews. When he says, Know ye not, brethren, uh, he's referring to his brethren in, in the Jewish faith. For I speak to them that know the law. They knew the law. They knew the law. And they also understood the dominion of it, the rules, the power of the law that the law had on a man. They knew that law. And they also knew the impossibility of keeping the law. In fact, in trying to make the law more compatible, they had added to the law trying to make it more simple. So when God says, thou shalt not steal, 
then they're going to take it and they'll go and they'll just say, well, let's make it a little more succinct. Let's make sure they understand what that means. You know, that uh, you, if you work for somebody that uh, you, you've got to show up uh, 10 minutes early and you've got to stay 10 minutes late. Or you got, and they just add all these laws to the law and, uh, because they're trying to make it compatible because they can't keep the simple law. They can't keep the simple things of God's law. When Jesus is asked, what, are the, what is the greatest law? He said that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. And listen, they knew immediately, we can't keep that law. We've proven we can't keep that law. And, and then Jesus says the second part of that, and that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And boy, I tell you, we have a trouble with that one, don't we? Amen. When you can't get the first one right, you're not going to get the second one right. And that's the truth. We can go back to the Ten Commandments do the same thing. If you can't keep those four forwards, four, you can't keep the last six. It just won't happen. Because if you can't keep your relationship with God the way it's supposed to be, they won't. And listen, we can't. That's the neat thing about the law is that the law tells us where it's impossible for us to live by the law. Amen. You know what? Most people's response then to that is, well, then forget it. I'll just, I'll just quit trying. But see, the law is to bring us to Christ. It's to make us aware of a need we have in our life. Not to push us away, but to draw us in. To help us see we need some help. People who've given up, they they just lost the purpose of the whole law. The law was to bring them to Christ. Now notice this, he also says that it's a lifelong dominion. The law had to be obeyed all the time, every day, every hour, of every day, if you're going to abide by the law, if the law is your, is your uh, standard for how you're going to have eternal life, then you've got to obey it all the time. You can't just pick and choose what days you want to do it or pick and choose what laws you want to obey. You have to obey all the law, all the time, if that's what your standard is for getting to heaven. Well, you say, well, isn't that God's standard for getting to heaven? You know what it is. It is God's standard for getting to heaven. And you know what that tells us? It's impossible for us to get to heaven by obeying the law. Paul is just, Paul is nailing this down time after time after time because so many people get it all mixed up. Listen, they had set rules. They had set, their, they had set rules for the days for work and the types of work you could do. They had set their days for serving God and the limits to their mobility of those days. They had established their dietary laws. They had given laws for personal hygiene. And they gave laws from birth to death. There was nothing for which it did not have instruction. The law was complete. I mean, it had every law that you needed to be able to know what you needed to do about everything to obey the law. Now then, Paul's going to step off now in an illustration. And as he does, the illustration is that of marriage. Now, here's your problem. Here's going to be your problem. You're going to want to think this about marriage. It's not about marriage. It's about the, the, our, our, our bondage to sin versus being free from sin. But here's what will happen at the end of the message. You're going to want to, well, Brother Jim, when it comes to marriage, then is this what? I must, I'm telling you right now up front. This is not about marriage, but it is some great information for us as he uses this illustration. But many people have taken this and made it about marriage and divorce. Listen, this this particular text doesn't even mention divorce, and people have made this about divorce. Doesn't even mention divorce. So let me tell you this right off. Let's stay with the text. Let's stay with the context of the text, and that is we're dealing with the law versus our freedom we have in Christ. That's what he's talking about. So let's look at what he says. Verse 2. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. Let me just, I'll point something out real quick just so you know. If this was about marriage, don't you think he would have also said that about the man? But see, he's chosen the wife and he's going to follow that through in this, in this text. So just, uh, I, I'm just pointing out the fact I just don't want you to get lost in this because he says something that you think doesn't really agree with what you think about marriage. Just stay with the text. The woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. The marriage contract is legally binding. We know that to be true. There are rules that have to be followed as a result of this, this uh, contract that we have. The I do commits a person 
in the contract to love the other person in sickness and in health, in poverty and wealth, forsaking all others. They'll keep themselves only to that one person. So this contract has some rules. It has some laws. It is, and you're bound by these laws when you enter into this covenant. Now the covenant is only as good as we who keep our promise. We find that to be true in marriage, don't we? Because we make a covenant at an altar, but the covenant only lasts as long as each person decides to keep their promise. The minute you decide not to keep your promise, what happens? It falls apart. I will throw that in about marriage, that uh, we need to keep our promises. But this particular covenant, if it's broken, the person, if, when it is broken, then the person can, um, can bring legal uh, lawsuit against the other person for violating that covenant. It's called divorce, amen? Amen. They can, they can file divorce. Why? Because they've not kept their promise. They've not lived by the covenant. So this covenant is, is binding. And that's what Paul is saying about this marriage contract. The marriage contract is binding. Once we enter that marriage contract, we are, we are, we are, we are bound to it till death. That's why I label this until death do us part. Because that's where this covenant goes. It can only be broken by Paul. Paul said it's only broken by death. Not divorce, by death. And that's until death do us part. Now this all applies to our relationship to the law. And unsaved, as unsaved, we are married to the law. We have to abide by the law for our salvation. If you're unsaved, there's only one way you can go to heaven, and that's by this law. We cannot be married to the law and be married to Christ at the same time. The law has to, according to what Paul is saying here, the, the, law, the law would have to die first. For the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. Now go on, verse 2 says, But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law to her husband. So as a widow, she's released from her oath. When the death of a husband, the wife is freed from her contract to be able to marry another person, another man. So all the promise she has made to the first, she can now make to the other. And when the law finally dies, it is then we can enter into the covenant relationship with Christ by grace. That's what he's teaching. When the law finally dies, when it no longer has that bond on us, then we can enter into a covenant relationship with Christ. It comes by grace, but not before. We cannot be married to both at the same time. We can't have, we can't be... It's spiritual adultery. Listen to what he says. Verse 3 goes on. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another, she, she shall be called an adulteress. If you're married to your mate and you decide to just marry another person while you're still married to your mate, you are considered an adulterer and a bigamist. Right? So you're an adulterer. You cannot cheat on your mate. He can't cheat on anybody. Now it's interesting because Paul's coming at this from, a, from, the, from the back side almost. He said if you're going along and you're saying I'm saved by the law, then you better be saved by the law. You better make sure you obey all those things because as, if you ever decide to cheat on that law, if you ever decide, well, I, I don't have to do that, then what you've done is you've cheated on the oath and you've just violated the oath and you will die in your sin. But if you get married to Christ. But you say, well, wait a minute. Don't you, you're saying, though, the, the law has to die. That oath has to die. That marriage contract with him, with the sin, has to die before I can be married to Christ. That's right. You say, Brother Jim, I'm confused. Okay, well, hang on with me, okay? <laughs> if you're married to the law, you cannot be married to Christ. Just as if you, now listen to this. Just as if you are married to Christ, you cannot be married to the law. Spiritual adultery is committed when we have made the covenant relationship with Christ and then go off playing handsies with the devil. You cannot be married to another. Verse 3 says, goes on and says, But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. It's only when that which has bound us in sin is finally destroyed, is finally killed, is finally nailed to the cross, that then we can have a real relationship to Christ. It's not complicated. 
You, you understand this. There's a lot of folks that want to tie the two together. Well, I believe I'm saved by grace, but I believe I've also got to belong to a certain church. I believe I'm saved by grace. I believe Jesus died for my sins, but I believe I've got to also live a certain way in order to maintain my salvation. So what they're doing is they're holding hands with both. They're saying, I believe in Jesus and His free gift of salvation. I'm going to be married to Him, but I'm also going to be married to the law because I've got to obey all these simple things over here too. And so to be able to stay in this relationship, I've got to continue to do all these things. And that's not true. That's the one thing that we've... If there's one thing I'm trying to get across to you, talk about sanctification and everything else, is that we've got to get away from this idea that in any way we can please God by our own self-righteousness. We can't do that. All the goody-goody things that you plan to do tomorrow or today or whatever, if they're not controlled by God, they are just goody-goody things. That's all they are. It's when God, it's when God takes control, when we, limit, when we eliminate that thing that has been our schoolmaster, when we eliminate that thing that has ruled over us and we begin to let Jesus Christ rule in our lives, that's when it takes effect. Let's go on. Verse 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, you also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even, so, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, I paraphrase that, and I, I, I don't know if I have this in your notes. I think I put it in there. But listen, this is the paraphrase. We had a first relationship to the law because of our flesh. But the law died as a result of the death of Christ. So now we can be in the second relationship with Christ who is raised from the dead and we can now live bringing forth fruit unto God. When that law was destroyed, when Jesus Christ paid the price, when he nailed it to his cross, it was done. It was taken care of. The first husband, let's put it that way. I put it in my notes. The first husband, verse 5. And we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. We were in the flesh. This is the first husband, the flesh, bound by the law. We were born into this relationship under the law. The law exposed us as sinners, and being under the law, we were always found guilty. That's why we were producing fruit unto death. The law only showed that we were guilty of the fact that we couldn't be uh, obedient enough. We couldn't be, we couldn't be straight enough. We couldn't be legal enough. There's no way for us to have kept those laws. It exposed us as being guilty. And so we acted under the power of that law of sin, which is the motions of sin he mentions here. Those motions of sin. We lived in that relationship producing fruits of the flesh. Fruit unto death. There was nothing else we could do because just as a wife is bound under her husband, we were bound to the flesh, bound to the law. We couldn't do anything else. We were bound by the law. We were guilty. We were sinners. And there was nothing to keep us from it because we were bound to it just as a woman would be bound to a husband. That's what he's saying. Now, verse 6 tells us about the second husband. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So now we can be married to a... When that old man, that old husband, the first husband, is dead, when he's been put to death by Christ dying on the cross and satisfying our sin, now we have the opportunity to be saved by faith through Jesus Christ. We are delivered from the law, being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The law had been our schoolmaster, but now we've been delivered from its power over us. The old schoolmasters, the old school teachers. I had one, I'll tell you one time, I'm telling myself here, uh, I was in the sixth grade, I think it was sixth grade, and we had this English teacher, and we had her right after. Uh, we had uh, P.E. and uh, went into the class and in P.E. I was chewing gum and I walked in the class and I was sitting on the back row on the back row and she's up there in the front and she looks up and she's Mr. Newton what have you got in your mouth I knew that I wasn't supposed to have that in my mouth that was the law I wasn't supposed to have that in my mouth and I told her I didn't have anything in my mouth 
as I slid the gum underneath my tongue in case she wanted to come look. She didn't. She went on with the class, but I knew I needed to get rid of that gum because I was going to chew it or pop it before long, and then I was going to be caught lying. I was just burying myself deeper and deeper. So I get a piece of paper, I wad it up, and I stick the gum inside of it, and I walk up, and I drop it in the wastebasket beside her desk. As I'm walking back to my desk, you know what she's doing? She's looking at that piece of paper, and when she finds the gum, guess where me and her go? She's the schoolmaster. I have to abide by her rules. I'm in her class. There's no way to get around that. That's the same thing with the law. You have to abide by those laws. And if you don't, you pay the price. We, that's what the law was, was our schoolmaster. But now we've been delivered from that power. When I got out of that class, praise God, I could chew gum anytime I wanted to. Amen? <laughs> she wasn't there to stop me. Now look, the law was satisfied in Christ's death. Flip over to Romans chapter 8. I, I'm get, you know what's so cool about this? Is that we're using text that we're going to come to in the future to prove what he's saying here. But it just is so good. Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do. The law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. That's where we find the problem with the law. We can't keep it because we're in the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. He satisfied the sin debt. He satisfied the law. The idea that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ and then remain saved by keeping the law is described as adultery in our text. It can't be both ways. You're either saved by keeping the law, which you can't be, or you are saved by putting your trust in Christ. You can't have it both ways. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of us... we. We commit, we commit spiritual adultery every day. You know, every time you sin, you commit spiritual adultery. If you're a child of God, you're married to Christ. Amen. And for you to sin means you went and held hands with the devil. You played footsie with the devil. You played house with the devil. You're married to Christ. You're a spiritual adulterer. Go ahead and call yourself that. That's what you are. Every time we sin, we're in spiritual adultery. I want to take us to a text to finish up this morning. Hebrews 10. I want you to turn there. What a powerful passage. I would say Paul wrote it, but there's those that say he didn't. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, so I won't be dogmatic about that. But I'm going to tell you, whoever wrote it, of course I know God did, and they got, he always gets it right. Beginning in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, it says, For the law... That's what we've been dealing with, the law, that bondage, having a shadow of good things to come. And it did, because we needed that righteousness in order to be saved. And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continue to make the comers there too perfect. So the law, with all of its finery, all of it has to promise, if we could keep it, is great except those who keep coming back and bringing the sacrifices that were required under the law, it says that it, it doesn't make them perfect. All of those sacrifices, verse 2, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers who were once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. I mean, if their sacrifices in the Old Testament, they brought the lambs, they brought the different sacrifices to the altar for their sin and all the rest. And uh, he said, if those sacrifices had satisfied, then why, had, why did they continue? Why did they keep coming back year after year after year to bring the sacrifices? They didn't have the ability to do anything. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So in fact, the sacrifice is just reminded the people of the fact that they couldn't keep the law. They bring the sacrifice because they broke the law during the year. Now they bring the sacrifice and that is just a constant reminder to them that they are they are they're unable to keep the law. Go on. Verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Now, none of us have been involved in those kind of sacrifices where we brought blood of goats or bulls to a sacrifice or an altar for our sin. 
But many of us have done other things in some way of trying to take care of our sin. Either we've made promises to God, God, I'll never do that again. If I do, God, then just strike me dead. You know what you just did? You just made a, you made a sacrifice that you can't keep. We, we bring sacrifice before the Lord all the time. And we need to stop. We need to recognize God's not satisfied with those sacrifices. He says, uh, verse 5, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, that's talking about Jesus, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. This is Jesus talking. Verse 6, In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. We go through the whole Old Testament. And they're giving these sacrifices year after year after year. And Jesus says, you've had no pleasure in those. And he hasn't. Why? Because they couldn't satisfy. They were just a picture of what was to come through Jesus Christ. Verse 7. Then said I, Jesus, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. This is Jesus speaking. Praying to the Father. Saying, I've come to satisfy. I've come to pay the price. I've come to do that which only you said uh, that we as God can do. Verse 8. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings of sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Now, he's referring exactly what I was talking about. He's taking care of the first husband. He's taking care of the first, which was the law that was given. He's taking care of that so now he can introduce to the second. So he can bring about the second. Until the first, the law is satisfied, we can't bring about the second. But because he takes away the first and nails it to his cross, now he can establish the second, which is salvation by grace in him. Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. Now, he's referred to the fact that all those Old Testament sacrifices year after year after year, time after time after time, had not taken away one sin. But I want to just clarify also, he said this, Jesus Christ satisfies for sin once for all. It's done. Is taken care of. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, but this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice, that of himself, for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Jesus' sacrifice paid it in full. When we finally decide that the law is dead, that we are no longer bound by the old legal system of the Old Testament, we're no longer bound by all the do's and the don'ts, but now we are bound only by the love of Christ, it'll make a world of difference in the way we respond. Our men met last Thursday night and we were talking about how to overcome sin. How do we do that? And we were looking at some of the formulas that we have. But let me tell you something. I've come to realize this, and by this, by this text that we just dealt with, comparing uh, our, our, our eternal life, our life in Christ with a married life, when you fall in love with Jesus like you're supposed to, you'll stop living in the world. You'll stop wanting to hold hands with the devil. You'll stop wanting to go after the things of the world because you get so in love with that one person. I'll be married to Ruby 50 years next year. I love her with all my heart. There is absolutely nothing in this world I would ever do to hurt that relationship. That's how much I love her, and most all of you know that. The same is true with God. If we just love God to the extent that we're supposed to, we won't struggle with sin the way that most do. If you're just in love with Jesus, if you're just in love with who He is, that's why it's important to spend time in God's Word because the more you spend time in God's Word, the more you understand about Him, the deeper your love grows for Him. And when your love finally grows to that depth where you refuse to let anyone, anything, bring you into spiritual adultery, then you're walking with God. You're walking in the Spirit. We're doing the things we're supposed to. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
Well, if you're here and you know Christ, the message you know is very clear to us. And that is we should walk in the newness of the Spirit. Walk in that newness of the Spirit that's bound to Jesus Christ. It's bound in the love of Christ. Don't be bound to the law. Don't be bound in those, into sin that rules and reigns in your life. Stop it and start walking in the Spirit. Walk as God requires of us. Walk where we need, not as required, but as He leads us to. Let's walk as Christ leads us. That's what we need to do. If you're, if you're here or listening and you've never come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you've never fallen in love with the Lord to that place, and you know that your life is, 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 is spun out in sin because you're bound by sin, you're bound by that law, you, you realize if I, if I die right now, my sin will take me straight to hell. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ came and died for you, and there's no reason for you to believe that. Jesus Christ wants to save you. Satan will continue to browbeat you into submission because that's the way he works. He comes to give death. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus comes to give eternal life and the abundant life. But you've got to put your faith in him. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. I pray, Father, that as we've gone through this message that it's, it's, it's become clear. At first, Lord, I know it seems to get a little confusing, but Father, the more we get into it, the more we understand how we are to fall in love with you. We're to have a relationship with you and no other. We have no business holding hands with the devil or the world. We have no business living in sin when we are in love with you. You are the one that we should be in love with, completely and wholly. And Father, I pray as we move further, even in our text, as we go further into this book, that it will come clear to us that we can live in that place of sinlessness. We can live in that place where uh, we walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Lord, if there's someone that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray even right now that they would call upon you. Lord, save me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, come in my heart. Let me have that eternal life that you promise. If you're there and you've made that commitment or you've said that prayer or you need to say that prayer, would you contact me? Would you let me know? Would you let somebody know that you're in need of that, that uh, decision? Let us walk through it with you and show you from Scripture how if you die today, you could know for sure that you're going to heaven. You don't have to doubt. You don't have to hope. You can be sure. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, don't forget tomorrow, no services to this evening. Uh, we will have Sunday school at 945. You've got just a minute for that. And then uh, uh, we have uh, service at 11 o'clock. You can go ahead and get dressed and come on and be a part of that service. We'd love to have you. No services tonight. And then uh, the, uh, the memorial service or funeral service for uh, our dear brother Vincent tomorrow at uh, 2 o'clock. And then Sally's memorial service Saturday at 10 o'clock. So I hope that you'll make yourself available for all of those. We love you, and we'll see you in a little bit.